Welcome back. In this web lecture, we're going to finish up our discussion of material transport in plants. So in the last segment, when we looked at transport through the xylem, the flow of water was typically from the roots upward toward the leaves in one direction, and we saw that there was a combination of a small push at the root level due to root pressure, but mostly this movement was going to be due to a transpirational pull generated by evaporation of water from the leaves and using the cohesion of water molecules to pull water all the way up through a continuous water column and out from the roots to the leaves. What we'll find in sugar transport in the phloem is that the flow is not strictly one direction. So remember that this sugar has to be delivered to pretty much all of the tissues of the plant that are not photosynthetic, that require sugar for their metabolism. So it's not gonna be a bulk transport of sugar just from the leaves down to the roots. It's going to need to be traveling all the way through this plant. And so there's gonna need to be some other mechanism besides just gravity or just a transpirational pull to move this sugar around through the plant. So let's Let's take a look at how that works. So the products of photosynthesis are transported through the phloem by a process that we call translocation. In angiosperms, these are the flowering plants, sieve tube elements are the conduits, the passageways for translocation. And when we talk about phloem sap, remember we had xylem sap that was water with dissolved nutrients in it. Phloem sap is similar, only it's water with sugars dissolved in it, so it's high in sucrose. So this is the basis for the maple syrup that we love so much in this part of the country. So it's going to travel from a sugar source, a place where the sugar is generated, to a sugar sink, the place where sugar is used. So a sugar source is an organ that's a net producer of sugar, such as mature, actively photosynthesizing leaves. And a sugar sink is an organ that's a net consumer or depository of sugar. So it can either be using up sugar because it's highly metabolically active, such as in a growing region of the plant that's uh, go undergoing active cell division, or a depository someplace that is storing up carbohydrates to be used later by the plant. And the location of sources and sinks in a plant can vary depending on the time of year and what stage in the life cycle a plant is. So here we see we've got sources, the leaves, a uh, sink might be developing flowers or fruits, also seeds, young leaves that are just beginning to grow that are highly metabolically active because they're actively growing, and the sink might also be roots or um, other underground carbohydrate storage such as tubers, remember tubers, uh, things like potatoes are modified stems that are growing underground, and even modified leaves that are being used for nutrient storage, such as things like onions. So early in the growing season, storage cells in the roots and stems are sources. So they're going to be releasing all of that carbohydrate that they have stored up as a source of energy for the growing plant. So they're going to be sources while the developing leaves that are just starting to grow out are gonna be sinks. They're going to be using up that energy for their growth. But later on in the growing season, when you start to have mature leaves that are actively generating sugar, they're going to be the sources while meristems developing leaves, flowers, seeds, and fruits, and also the storage cells in roots and tubers and other underground storage will be the sinks. So that reverses depending on the growing season and where the source of energy is. Are they using stored energy or are they actively photosynthesizing to create energy? So to get to the place where the sugars are going to be used, the sugar has to be loaded into these sieve tube elements before they can be exported to sinks. Depending on the species, the sugar might move into the sieve tube elements by symplastic roots, so entirely within the living part of the cell, or by both symplastic and apoplastic pathways. So depending on the species, the sugars might move out of the symplast and then move back in in the companion cells or maybe in the sieve tube elements themselves. So there'll be some interspecies variation in how that sugar actually moves toward the sieve tube elements. Companion cells enhance the solute movement between the apoplast and the symplast, so they're going to be helping to enhance that movement into the sieve tube element. Let's see how that works. 
So in many plants, phloem loading requires active transport. This makes sense because if you're actively generating all these sugars, you're gonna have a very high sugar concentration around the source. And so you're basically going to try to accumulate that sugar into these sieve tube elements to be able to transport them. You're gonna be moving sugar against its concentration gradient. So it's going to require some active transport. So generally this is done by proton pumping and then co-transport of sucrose and protons to enable the cells to accumulate sucrose. So remember, we use ATP to actively pump hydrogen ions or protons out of the cell, and then this co-transporter protein allows the protons to move back into the cell along their electrochemical gradient, but only if they take a sucrose molecule with them. So that's what the co-transporter is. They have to both be bound before this will open up and allow that transport. At the sink, in most cases, sugar molecules are going to diffuse from the phloem to the sink tissues, and then water will follow passively by osmosis. So let's now think about what is the force that causes these sugars to move from source to sink? What is the forcing like? Phloem sap moves through a sieve tube by bulk flow. So remember that when we say bulk flow, we're talking about some kind of pressure-driven flow that's going to be flowing at a greater rate than would be possible by diffusion alone. So this bulk flow is going to be driven by positive pressure called pressure flow. So remember that in the xylem, what we saw was bulk flow by negative pressure, so a suction pressure coming from the top. This is similar to um, sucking liquid through a straw under negative pressure. This is going to be a pushing pressure, a positive pressure in the phloem from source to sink. Phloem sap flows from sources where pressure is high to sinks where pressure is low. So let's take a look at how those high and low pressures are generated. The pressure flow hypothesis explains how sugars are moved through the phloem. Events at the source and sink tissues are going to create a pressure potential gradient in the phloem. So they're gonna move from greater pressure to lower pressure. And the water in the phloem sap moves down this pressure gradient. And of course the sugars are dissolved in the water. They're going to be carried along by bulk flow. And the source of this positive pressure is going to be differences in turgor pressure in the phloem. So there's gonna be a higher turgor pressure near the source in those uh, sieve tube elements and lower turgor pressure near the sink tissues. So this is what's going to generate the force that drives the flow. So creating these differences in turgor pressure requires energy expenditure by the plant. So let's see how this pressure gradient is accomplished. In phloem loading, sucrose is moved by active transport from source cells through companion cells to sieve tube members. So here we see the sugar being generated in the mesophyll cell being actively transported into the companion cell. Here we see an accumulation of sucrose. So we're gonna use ATP to create that hydrogen ion gradient and use co-transporters to transport sucrose against its concentration gradient and water is going to be brought in by diffusion. So water follows the active transport of the sucrose uh, passively, but this is going to create an expansion of the volume of the companion cells and also the sieve tube elements because things are going to be just flowing into the sieve tube elements freely through these plasmodesmata. So there's going to be an increase in turgor pressure in both of these two cell types due to the concentration of those solutes and the flow of water into the cell as a result of that. So turgor pressure is going to build in the sieve tube elements in the source region. So remember that proton pumps in the membranes of the companion cells are gonna create a strong electrochemical gradient that favors a flow of protons into companion cells. A co-transporter in the membranes of companion cells uses the proton gradient to bring sucrose into companion cells from the source cells against its concentration gradient. So this is active transport using a co-transporter and a proton pump. And then once inside the companion cells, sucrose and water um, are going to move into those sieve tube elements via the plasmodesmata. So there's going to be a free flow. And so those companion cells and the sieve tube elements are going to increase in volume together due to that free movement and create that turgor pressure. So now let's see how this is unloaded at the sink. So in phloem unloading, cells in the sink remove the sucrose from the phloem sap 
by passive or active transport depending on what kind of sink it is. So due to the loss of solutes, water follows passively and turgor pressure in the sieve tube elements drop. So because of this movement out of the sieve tube elements, water is going to follow those sucrose molecules and the turgor pressure within these sieve tube elements is going to decrease as water flows not just into the sink cells, but it's also going to flow into the xylem due to the negative pressure in nearby xylem vessels. So the net result of phloem loading and unloading is high turgor pressure near the source and low turgor pressure near the sink, which drives phloem sap from the source to the sink under positive pressure. So these cells are squeezing physically on it. These are releasing that turgor pressure due to the flow of water out of them, and that creates the positive pressure gradient. So there's a one-way flow of sucrose from the source to the sink, but there's also a continuous loop of water movement as water flows between the xylem and the sieve tube elements. So as I mentioned briefly, the way in which the sugar unloading is going to happen in the sink depends on what sort of a sink it is. So if we look at an example of sugar beets in different parts of the plant, phloem unloading in the young growing leaves, so remember these are very metabolically active tissues that are actively growing, in those leaves, the unloading is going to occur by simple diffusion. Why? Because the tissues are using up that sugar as it's delivered, so they're continuously going to have a very low concentration of sucrose in their tissues, and then the sucrose is going to flow by simple diffusion from, from the phloem because that concentration is constantly being diminished. So in the root cells, they have a large vacuole that stores sucrose and accumulates it, and it's going to be surrounded by a membrane called the tonoplast. And the tonoplast contains two types of proton pumps that work to accumulate sucrose in the vacuole. So this now we're going to be transporting sucrose against its concentration gradient because we want to accumulate it in these tissues. So as the protons diffuse back out of the vacuole, a special kind of co-transporter that transports the protons and the co-transported molecule in opposite directions, this is called an antiporter. So this is a specialized kind of co-transporter membrane protein. So this proton sucrose antiporter is going to move sucrose into the vacuole against its concentration gradient as the protons diffuse back out of the vacuole. So let's take a look again, just to make sure you're clear in your mind about this difference between a sink that's actively using up the sucrose and one that's storing it. Here we have a developing leaf cell that is using up the sucrose. It has a low concentration of sucrose because it's being used up, and so the sucrose from the sieve tube member can just passively diffuse into it from a high concentration to a low concentration along its concentration gradient. On the other hand, if it's being accumulated, it needs to be actively transported into the storage vacuole. Going into the companion cell and outside of this vacuole, we're going to have a low concentration of sucrose, and so passive diffusion will move it through the companion cell and into the root cell, but then it needs to be actively transported using ATP and hydrogen ion pumps to be able to use this kind of two-way co-transporter, this antiporter, to accumulate sucrose in this vacuole against its concentration gradient. This pressure flow model has been tested in various ways. One of the nicest, cleanest kind of tests of this were ones using aphids, which are small insects that ingest phloem sap, so they're kind of leaf sucker insects. And what they do is they insert a mouth part called a stylet, uh, this sort of syringe-like mouth part, into the sieve tube members. And the pressure of the fluid in these cells forces it through the stylet into the aphid's digestive tract and actually all the way out its anus as droplets of honeydew. So here's a little droplet of that sap. And so we have two forms of evidence from these experiments that confirm the pressure flow model. One is if you take one of these stylets out of the aphid and insert it into the sieve tube members, you get a sap droplet forced out of it. So what does this tell us? This tells us that the aphid is not sucking the sap out, that the sap is being forced out under positive pressure. So we know 
from that evidence that there actually is positive pressure within these sieve tube elements that's driving the flow of the phloem sap. The other piece of evidence from these experiments is that the experimenters inserted the stylet uh, at different distances from the sugar source, so from the actively photosynthesizing tissue, and as predicted by the pressure flow model, the closer the stylet was to a sugar source, the higher its sugar concentration was. So we've got a highly concentrated sugar that's going to increase the turgor pressure near the source, lower concentration of sugar that's going to decrease the turgor pressure in that area, all consistent with the model that we just described. And so let's wrap up this topic by thinking about the symplast. So the living tissues through which all this transport occurs, and it's really easy to start thinking of these as just kind of a passive tube and, and forget that these are actually living tissues, especially in the phloem. So the symplast is a living tissue and is responsible for dynamic changes in plant transport processes. So we generally think of plasmodesmata as just these little open holes in between cells, but it turns out that they can open or close in response to turgor pressure, uh, cytosolic calcium levels, or cytosolic pH. So these can actually be actively constricted or dilated as needed in the plant to either encourage or discourage flow between cells. And phloem is also a superhighway, so this is a, a transport system for more than just sugars. It's going to allow system-wide movement of macromolecules and viruses. So we're going to see in the next section that the phloem is also used for transporting hormones, but it can also be exploited by viruses to allow viruses to spread throughout the plant tissue. This systemic communication through the phloem helps to integrate functions of the whole plant, and we're going to see this as we look at how the plant responds to its environment through the use of hormones. Also, the phloem can allow some rapid electrical communication between widely separated organs very similar to the nervous system that we see in animals. So for example, in plants such as one called the sensitive plant, also what might be more familiar to you, things like Venus flytraps that actually have leaves with fairly rapid movements. Um, these electrical signals have been detected in these plants that help to mediate these, these rapid movements. So as I just mentioned, one of the materials that's transported through the phloem are plant hormones, and so that's going to be the subject of our next couple of classes as we think about how plants respond to different factors in their environment and how hormones help to mediate the responses to these environmental factors.